It was Central Asia's cradle of culture for more than two millennia. Uzbekistan, home to a storied history and a wealth of architectural wonders from days of old. But its modern history is far less romantic. For 60 years, Uzbekistan had been closed to the world. First, as a secret military research base under the Soviet Union, and later, as a hermit state under an authoritarian government. It was only in 2017 when things changed. Uzbekistan today is uh, conducting very serious reforms. I can even compare that with Chinese historical periods when they had the opening up. A new president has taken over. Uzbekistan is now open for business, and the money is pouring in. Leading the charge is China, who want Uzbekistan in on its Belt and Road Master Plan. Spectacular plans are underway for a Silk Road of cereals. You're hoping to make China your biggest market then? Yes, yes. Along with ambitious plans to transform some of the oldest and most mysterious cities on the Silk Road. Will Central Asia once again be the center of global trade? A Belt and Road initiative linking China and Russia has sparked celebration and concern. Rival powers, Russia and China, Russia and with China. Russia or China? In my journey along the road to Russia, I'll visit China's border cities with Russia. This entire city is lit in gold. I'll discover the splendors of Mongolia with its untapped riches. It's like a house on wheels. Yeah. Mysterious Uzbekistan through its stunning cities. And I'll explore the Kremlin and the power it wields. This is my journey through one of China's key economic corridors on its Belt and Road. I'm in the far west of Uzbekistan in Central Asia. And around me, for 650 kilometers, is desert in every direction. Over here, the great ships of the desert are the camels. It was these magnificent animals that carried treasure east to west on the ancient Silk Road. Along this mighty trading route, China sent paper-making technology to the Arab world and in turn received Islam. Cotton and Buddhism traveled east from India to China and silk was carried thousands of kilometers in these deserts to reach Rome. All right, this way, hey, hey, come on, come on, come on, come on. Man, it must have not been easy for the travelers back then because these camels have a mind of their own. Come on, let's go, let's go, there we go. Good job, boy. Good boy. Good boy. Oh, man. Oh, oh. All right. I hope you have insurance. Of course, there wasn't any insurance in those days, and many traveling traders didn't survive those long, difficult trips. But those who did profited handsomely. The ancient Silk Road was the very first form of globalization in action, and Uzbekistan saw plenty of that action. The country boasted some of the most important cities in the route. And here's one of them, Bukhara. Bukhara was a great trading city 2,500 years ago. It offered water and shelter to weary travelers going to and from China and a thriving market for which to trade. And I couldn't have picked a better time to come.
This is the Bukhara Silk and Spices Festival, an annual event celebrating Bukhara's ancient Silk Road links. People of all ages come out to celebrate their folk songs and traditional dances. All of these costumes and performances we're seeing now were already in existence on the ancient Silk Road. So I can imagine that if you came here thousands of years ago, you'd enter the city and be blown away by all the exotic colors and sounds. The city may be ancient, but its people are young. In this country, 60% of the population is below the age of 30, and parties are lively affairs. Everybody seems to be in high spirits. In the past, traders from China heading to Europe passed through the city on caravans loaded with silks and spices. They came to meet the city's master craftsmen, experts on pottery, embroidery, carpets, and more. The city was also famous for its blacksmiths. Bukharan knives were legendary for their extra sharp blades. They were handy deterrents against bandit raids, a common feature on any Silk Road expedition. These would have fetched a princely sum back in those early days of global trade. The traders have long stopped coming. They've since been replaced by tourists. One group of tourists in particular stand out. Since the launch of the Belt and Road Initiative, there's been a surge in tourism in many ancient Silk Road cities, all thanks to the Chinese, who are promoting the Silk Road in earnest. Hey, so your Mandarin's pretty good, huh? I can Chinese, I can I can I can My Mandarin's terrible. Oh. So why did you study Mandarin? A lot of tourists from China is coming, and there are a few people who speak Chinese in Uzbekistan. Is studying Mandarin popular among your peers? Yes, so a lot of people now are going to China to study, and we have in Uzbekistan two Confucius universities, so where the people go and attend Chinese classes. Are there more Chinese tourists coming here now? Yes, this last two, three years, like uh, a lot of Chinese people are coming to Uzbekistan, because you know, uh, all the cities of Uzbekistan are very like uh, ancient, and they are in the Silk Road, so that's why they come here to visit so tourism dollars coming in from China, that's got to be good for you. Yes, of course, I can start my own business. Fantastic, good luck with that. Uh, thank you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> tourism is a major industry in Uzbekistan, and it is not just young Uzbeks getting primed for the Chinese wave. Hi, Kamil. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, welcome. What a beautiful place you have. Thank you. Let me show you around. Oh, I'd love to see the rest of it. Let me show you our beautiful 19th century dining room. Oh man, look at this. Wow. So this is 19th century? Yeah, this is original 19th century dining room. It stayed uh, untouched for more than 100 years. So here always used to be parties. 
Who is the original owner of this? The house was built for rich merchant who used to trade watches and clock. I'm sure you have to do some repair work from time to time too, though. Yeah, right? but uh, we are going to keep as it is so the people can feel the atmosphere. Nowadays, a lot of business are going on with the Chinese companies and big companies, small companies. And of course, when the people coming to work here, they want to show the country where they're working. They will bring more like families and uh, relatives and uh, friends. You know, today we hear a lot about the new Silk Road in global media. How has that impacted um, old Silk Road cities like Bukhara? For sure, I think that uh, uh, more, more and more people will come to Uzbekistan uh, because it's uh, more publicity about uh, the Silk Road in the last three, four years, because it's a uh, big publicity about uh, the Silk Road, about Uzbekistan, and uh, more and more visitors from China are visiting our country. Do you have plans to cater to the Chinese tourists? I think we will hire the person who will speak Chinese and we probably will translate our web page to the Chinese language. China Silk Road is accelerating change in Central Asia. And change has come, not just from tourism alone. Central Asia, in the minds of the Chinese, is the buckle of the Belt and Road and many industries here are being transformed. How important is Central Asia to the overall Belt and Road Initiative? I think that if we look at the map, uh, we can find that the, uh, the importance of Central Asia in uh, BRI, because it, it would be the first stop for China to uh, uh, go out uh, uh, from China on the road of the uh, Belt. And also Central Asia region is a very, very important area, not only for Chinese economy, especially for Chinese security. What's Uzbekistan, I think it's also a very important country in Central Asia. And also, Uzbekistan has a very good relations with China, and also both with Russia. So I think it will give a very, very important reason or more important dynamics for China, Russia, and the regional uh, uh, peace and uh, development. It's not just the ancient cities that are changing. Tashkent, the country's capital, is also getting a makeover. I'm headed there on a high-speed train. from tiny oasis town in the second century BC to Tashkent, a thriving modern metropolis with two and a half million residents. This place is now Central Asia's biggest city. There is a legend that Tashkent was halfway between China, where all the silk was coming from, and Europe, its destination. Tashkent is the seat of government and Soviet architecture is evident everywhere. That's because Uzbekistan was part of the Soviet Union up until 1991. On that year, the Soviet Union broke apart, and Islam Karimov became president of the newly independent country. But his rule of more than two decades was marred by allegations of corruption and human rights abuses. Activists were locked up, Uzbekistan was relatively closed to the rest of the world. Karimov died in 2016. And now, the new administration is trying to do things differently. A five-year plan has been put in place to turbocharge the economy that has been stagnant for years. Now, the excitement can even be felt in the marketplaces. Here at a carnival, a man is about to lift the 300 kilogram camel with his teeth. The strong man is ambitious. So too is Uzbekistan's new government. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure I look up.
The government uh, announced its five-year plan in 2017. The plan is uh, around five different areas, and those areas, of course, are covering a wide range of issues, starting from the political system reform and finishing with the economy, social life and others. Are you confident it can be achieved? Of course. I would be honest with you, as a citizen of Uzbekistan, two and a half years ago, I wasn't a member of the government yet, but I was rather skeptical or cautious about whether we would be able to achieve all those goals. But nowadays, I'm very optimistic. Uzbekistan today is uh, conducting very serious reforms. And uh, I can even compare that with uh, a Japanese or Chinese um, uh, historical periods when they had the opening up. So, so we are in a quite historical moment right now. The new plan, together with China's Belt and Road Initiative, is expected to bring monumental changes to the country. Not only has the Uzbek government signed some 15 billion US dollars worth of investment deals on jointly developing the country's oil, gas, and uranium fields, the two governments also agreed to cooperate in building railways, road networks, telecommunications infrastructure, and industrial parks. China is our major trade partner at the moment. And of course, when we're talking about investments, especially foreign direct investments, China is also number one. Uzbekistan has captured the world's attention. This is the largest underdeveloped Central Asia market. In Central Asia, still 70% of the investments go to Kazakhstan, and being Uzbekistan second with 16%. But uh, and nowadays, Uzbekistan is uh, becoming one of the big uh, players because of the, uh, first of all, we have the, one of the biggest markets, the most dense country in the region, and with 32 million population, of course, uh, it's, a, it's a big market for, for um, investors. A few years ago, foreign journalists like myself wouldn't even have been allowed to work here. But now the country is welcoming to both media and business. You can feel it in the air. The country is on the cusp of change, and it's an exciting time to be here. I'm traveling on China's Silk Road in Uzbekistan. And this is the capital city, Tashkent. One major aspect of China's Silk Road are its railroads. China has built railways across the world. And here in Uzbekistan, yet another ambitious rail connection will soon be underway. But before I head to the new railway, there's an old rail system I must see. Man, look at this metro station. Uzbekistan has a proud history when it comes to railways. This is the Tashkent Metro. Built by the Soviets in 1977, it was Central Asia's first urban rail line. It still is one of the most stunning metros anywhere. There are 29 stations, each with its own unique architectural theme. For a long time, there was a photography ban on these secret railway stations. That's because they served another role, as nuclear fallout shelters. Uzbekistan's metro stations were important military installations. It was only in 2018 that the photography ban got lifted allowing journalists like us to bring you these gorgeous images. There's one dedicated to cotton, the country's main export. One to Uzbek rulers of old. And this one is dedicated to more otherworldly aspirations. It's the cosmonaut station.
celebrating space travel, the stars, and everything celestial. With an array of murals and glass and light shows that confound the mind. Here is a painting of Gagarin, the first man in space, and he was a Russian. This whole station feels very cool and dark and evokes this feeling like you're in outer space. The Russians did a decent job getting the city of Tashkent connected, but it is the Chinese who will help connect Uzbekistan to the world. Uzbekistan is one of two only double landlocked countries in the world. Do you know the second one? Uh, is it Kazakhstan? No, no, that's Liechtenstein in Europe. Okay. And double landlocked country means that we have to pass the borders of at least two countries to reach the sea. So all our neighbors are also landlocked countries and we are double landlocked countries. So for us, the logistics, transport corridors, these are very important. The Belt and Road Initiative, it basically uh, focuses on uh, reintroduction of all this, you know, connectivity between Europe, Asia, so that the, the, the goods can, you know, be easily transported from the Yellow Sea, for example, to the Europe. And Uzbekistan is just in the center of this route. In September 2016, China inaugurated a railway line that runs through Uzbekistan to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Now, it wants to build another line, connecting Uzbekistan to Kyrgyzstan and onwards to China. The railway linking Kabul, which is capital of Afghanistan, and Peshawar, which is in Pakistan. And this will allow us to link the whole railway system of Central Asia, CIS, Europe, with the South Asian rail link, railways, Pakistan, India. And this will, of course, open enormous opportunities, you know, unprecedented opportunities for boosting trade between different regions of the world, especially in the Eurasian continent. This is what Belt and Road Initiative is about. Then Uzbekistan will be fully plugged in, huh? Of course. I mean, after that, we will not be concerned so much about our double landlocked status, and we will become like Liechtenstein. These railway links will have a huge impact on industry. And one industry is perfectly poised to prosper. Cotton from which these clothes are made, is Uzbekistan's third largest export earner. After natural gas and food agriculture. The country is one of the world's largest cotton producers. Cotton is so important here that it's called white gold. On any given month, 3,000 tons of cotton gets exported from Tashkent to Xi'an in China along the Silk Road. That's enough to make 10 million t-shirts. <laughs> to see how all this fashion is made, I've come to one of the country's largest textile companies. Check out all this cotton. Hi, Umar. Hello, Hi. how are you doing? Good, 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 good to nice. meet you. So this is the factory, huh? Yes. And this is step one in the long journey from bloom to fabric. Whole purpose of the department is to clean the cotton. So this machine is the fine cleaning machine. So it'd be like moving particles like uh, maybe dead insects and dust 
Yeah, it, uh, it, it takes some black particles, blue, red. The computer scans the cotton for these particles and they get mechanically extracted. The next step is to comb the cotton. Automation supercharges this otherwise tedious process. This is a cutting process uh, from cotton fiber. The fiber is uh, finely cleaned. It is like as how you comb your hair. Okay. So the fiber basically are formed in this machine, and then the finally you, you see a product. This right here, it still looks like it's in a loose form though. Yeah, because uh, here we don't have the twist in the fiber. So for the next process is where we make, uh, we go towards the spinning process, we have uh, the twist. Six slivers are twisted into one thread. From start to finish, it takes five days and involves many machines and hands. And that's just to make thread. How much cotton does it take to make, let's say, like your yeah. t-shirt? Yeah, this. Ah, okay. Now, how has the Belt and Road Initiative, how has that impacted your business? The fashion industry is going fast. And in fact, every industry is going, going fast. So everybody needs the, uh, the products in time. So uh, definitely Belt and Road uh, Initiative, uh, it gives a great infrastructure for the producers to supply to their customer just in time strategy. So surely it will reduce your capital investment over your stocks. So you can make planning with lower stocks in your warehouse and get the products, fresh products, just in time. If you are in a geographical position where your delivery times are more, definitely you will attract less customers due to your delivery time, even if you are producing very high quality. The output in this Uzbek factory feeds China's insatiable demand for cotton. China remains the world's biggest clothing exporter despite rising labor costs. It's the new Silk Road that's helping China stay on top of the textile trade. Major brands require fashion to be fast, which means that runway trends should be available in shops in less than a month. As of 2017, about 90% of all fast fashion worldwide is transported by either sea or rail. And it's the Belt and Road, in its opening up of new global links and appendages, that's helping suppliers cope with growing global demand. It's making it faster for cotton in Uzbekistan to wind up in China's textile factories, to be transformed into a piece of clothing, and reach the stores you shop in. Nowadays, even if you talk about the fashion industry, it's going very fast. So everybody needs to have new things very fast. And uh, to react overall to the supply chain, uh, the infrastructure is very important. The new Silk Road will set up sweeping changes, not just in the fashion business, but across industries. Some trades are up for the chop. This is Chorsu Bazaar, Tashkent's best-known market. The dome is one of the city's most iconic landmarks, an impressive setting for an equally impressive showcase of people and produce on the move. Look at all these carrots. They even chop it up for you, too. Now that's convenient. See this? Looks like cheese, right? It's actually blocks of cow fat. The food here is intriguing, but it's in the fruit trade where the sweetest deals are being made. Many Chinese companies have stopped importing American fruits because of the U.S.-China trade war. Many have turned to Central Asia. To get insight, I'm meeting with the man responsible for Uzbekistan's food exports. 
all uh, products that you are seeing here, we export to all over the world. Ah, okay. For example, this premium class resins we export to China. Please try. Oh, sure. All right. Yeah. Oh, very nice. Do you like it? Yeah. Yes. But we have other fruits as well. Mm -hmm. uh, now we'll go to fresh fruit stuff. Currently, we are exporting fresh cherries to China. Ah. Okay. And what other fruits and vegetables are you hoping to export as well? Uzbekistan is planning to have the permission of export uh, to China for fresh produce like apricots, fresh melons. Hmm. And then I hope uh, step by step we increase our fresh produce exports to China, such as plums, peaches, whatever other fresh fruits uh, that uh, China market uh, will like, I hope we will export that. Is Russia your biggest customer? Yes, Russia is uh, currently our biggest customer. Mm -hmm. But very soon we will access to China market. China is 10 times more uh, bigger than Russia market is. Then the volume will be uh, bigger than what currently uh, we are exporting to Russia. I see. So you're hoping to make China your biggest market then? Yes, yes. Of the many facets discussed about the Belt and Road Initiative, the focus on agriculture is often overlooked. Yet food security ranks high on any country's agenda. And China is no exception. China is currently grappling with a daunting conundrum. How to feed nearly one-fifth of the world's population with less than one-tenth of its farmland. For example, the Chinese eat nearly three times as much meat as in 1990. To keep up with demand, they have had to diversify food imports. According to a Chinese national action plan under the Belt and Road Initiative, provinces in western China will work with Central Asia in fruit, grain, and animal husbandry. For Uzbekistan, which depends on agriculture for about a quarter of all jobs, the Chinese plan spells opportunity. What is this? This is Uzbek plov. This is Uzbek plov with a recipe more than 1,000 years old. Oh, wow. It's made of rice and tasty meat and carrots, raisins. You know, this dish looks a lot like uh, biryani. Yeah. So I'm sure this recipe must have traveled along the ancient Silk Road. Yes. It is a uh, travel from whole the uh, Silk Road to Uzbekistan. And you can find the plovs with a different recipe in every province of Uzbekistan. And also in different uh, parts of the world. For example, in Turkey, pilaf mm. they have. Uh, in Afghanistan. Well, it looks very tasty and I'm starving, so let's go yes. try it out, huh? Yes. So back to our earlier topic. Yes. How has China's Belt and Road Initiative impacted the agriculture sector? It is uh, boosting our uh, agriculture sector because uh, the market is getting wider and wider and we are importing from China new agricultural machinery and new innovations, uh, new seeds and new technologies coming from China from, by using this uh, one belt and one road strategy. Now, are Chinese companies coming here to Uzbekistan and investing in the uh, agriculture? business? Yes, they are investing a lot. They are investing in different parts of uh, agriculture sector, from seeding up to uh, processing, storaging, logistic. According to Xinhua News, China's total food imports amounted to 58.28 billion U.S. dollars in 2017. The figure rises 25 percent year on year. Experts believe that if current growth rates continue, China will become the world's largest food importer. Chinese companies have already been buying up land and water resources, along with dairies and food processing factories across the world. China's big agriculture companies are jumping on the Belt and Road bandwagon. They speak enthusiastically of a Silk Road of cereals and a Silk Road Dairy Alliance. Chinese 
，那么四季都可以种植，因为知道物资夏天是非常的热的，外边的温度可以达到五十多度。那么当这个季节不可以种植的时候，我们这个大棚也是可以种植的，因为它有现代化的控制温度湿透的这个系统和设施。How do you control the temperature? 我们有这个专业的这个水帘。和这个风机，它们组合起来，外边的温度，呃，五十度的时候，它可以把这个大棚的温度降到二十八度以下。冬天的时候呢，也有这种加热的暖气，然后也可以种植。那么它这个温度和湿度的控制都是用这种电脑上可以查，也就是说，老板在国内，呃，都可以看到这里有有多少度湿度，然后是怎么样的一个情况，都是可以知道的。That's uh, both impressive and scary. In Shanghai, the camera looks at the workers. Are they doing anything? I guess the workers can't slack off then, huh? Yes, they can't. There are over 1,200 Chinese companies in Uzbekistan. Pengsheng is the largest of them all. And their business extends way beyond agriculture. They've also built 16 factories that are churning out shoes, leather products, water taps, and ceramic tiles. This is our Shuilong Tong Fanmen Wei Yu Chang. This is the only one that can produce from the tong to 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 the tong. This is one of 16 factories that your company has built. Why has your company invested so much money here? First, uh, Uzbekistan is located in the middle of the country. In the ancient way of the Sea Road, this is also an important place for the culture and culture. It is also an important place for the culture and culture. Second, the political and social stability here is very important. The people of the village are very friendly to the outside people. This is also an important place for the investment and safety of the country. The population of the Uzi is about 5 people, and the number of the population is very high. There is another point that they have been able to protect the rights of foreign investors, and they have also been able to protect the rights of foreign investors. The Chinese government has always encouraged the Chinese government to go out. In this situation, the two governments have been able to protect the rights of foreign investors, and the Chinese government has been able to protect the rights of foreign investors. How many employees are working here? 一共有一千三百多乌方员工和两百多中方员工。The average income in many factories in this country is about 150 U.S. dollars a month. 25-year-old Kamol Kenyar makes about double that amount after five years of work experience here at Pengsheng. Me alatim mazim oligam. Me gözümün yaş oylam ge, hem de akıl ke, onun ge senin ge bin malat yeti vardır. Tamirlaşım mümkün bu oylam, bilen bin malat. There's another benefit to working in Pengsheng. Free childcare. Hello, everyone. Oh wow, so four languages, huh? Yes, they use four languages to say hello. Because in this area, one of the kids is saying Wu-Yu, one of the kids is saying Han-Yu, and another one is saying Ur-Yu. Then we also start the English and Han-Yu class, so they can use four languages to communicate with each other. The school was originally set up for the workers from China who relocated their families to Uzbekistan and had no local childcare option. Today, this kindergarten is also popular amongst the locals. It is initiatives like this that win hearts and minds on China's Silk Road. To thank the kids for their time, I brought a special treat. Hey, you want one here? Come in, come in. Whoa, whoa, I see some of you are taking more than one. Thank you. You're welcome, you're welcome. This is compliments of TNA, all right? Back in Singapore. Enjoy, enjoy.
This is the Tashkent campus of the Management Development Institute of Singapore. The school was set up in 2007. Today, it caters to about 2,900 students. So why did you choose to study here at this school? Personally, I chose this uh, university because of the variety of programs they offer. This is the only place in Uzbekistan to study risk and management. That's why I came here. Where do you think the Uzbekistani economy is going? I would say we entered a new phase in our development because uh, for the last like, 20, 25 years, we've been looking for stability. Uh, now we entered a phase when we want to see changes. There are plenty of changes, reforms in taxation system, in financial systems. Now we're trying to make uh, our country even better, to rise. What are your thoughts on the Belt and Road Initiative? Now I have some of my friends who, who is studying Chinese now and looking for partners in China already, because uh, when the initiative will start, bringing this uh, new organization it will be very competitive. And if you have now someone, partner in China, that will be great. For example, in other uh, local universities, people are or has already started uh, learning uh, Chinese, Mandarin. Some of our students are right now started like uh, working in logistics. And right now our university actually provides uh, MBA program for supply chain management. So I think it's a good initiative for us. The Belt and Road Initiative was launched in 2013. Initially, it was Confucius Institutes funded by China that offered training opportunities related to the BRI. Now, many independent and state-funded schools all over Central Asia are also tweaking their curriculum to support the needs of the BRI. Singaporean Andrew Chu, who heads the school, has lived here the last three years. So what do you think are the prospects of the Uzbek economy? Uzbekistan is a developing country. Uh, it's an economy that has a lot of potential. For example, in terms of tourism, that's an area with a huge potential to be tapped on. But before they can do that, for example, they need to really improve the infrastructure. They have to improve the processes. Uh, they have to do this very quickly, very systematically, uh, very methodically and over a very short time frame. One of the top tourism sites in Uzbekistan is Samarkand. And I've heard there is a huge Belt and Road Initiative by China to help the Uzbeks ramp up their tourism infrastructure here. But before I discover the details of this plan, I need to understand the city's history. Samarkand was a vital stop on the ancient Silk Road, where Chinese traders met their Persian, Arab, and European counterparts. But it wasn't always fair trade. Legend has it that in the year 751, the secret of papermaking was obtained from two Chinese prisoners here. This led to the first paper mill being set up outside of China. The invention then spread to the rest of the Islamic world and from there to Europe. Being a rich trading city, it was also fought over by many powers. It was conquered by Genghis Khan in 1220, and also at one time, a Tang Dynasty protectorate. But it was Timur, one of Central Asia's most famous historic figures, who gave Samarkand these magnificent buildings. Timur claimed an empire of his own in the 14th century, a territory that stretched from South Asia to the Middle East, extending all the way from Delhi to Aleppo. He slaughtered millions and sent the skilled artisans and craftsmen back to his capital here at Samarkand. Today, thousands still come to his tomb every year to pay their respects including the Uzbek Special Forces. It is believed that Timur, the great conqueror, died while on his way to wage war against the Ming Emperor. In the year 1405, Timur had gathered an army of 200,000 men to invade China. But Timur was 69 years old already at the time, and he never made it to the borders of China.
Nowadays, it is the Chinese who come to see him. And it's not just the tourists. A few blocks away from Timur's tomb, Chinese architects are hard at work. Under the BRI, Chinese urban planners are working to redesign Samarkand. And it will be paid for by the Chinese Silk Road Fund. Under the plan, which was made in consultation with the Uzbek government, the population of Samarkand will be doubled to one million. 未来的撒马罕城市呢，我们希望它能成为乌兹别克斯坦国家第二大城市，未来就要变成一百万级的这个城市人口。那么这样的话，就会会和首都塔什干会形成一个双城并行的这么一个，还引领整个国家的经济向前发展。我们未来要规划几个产业园区啊和工业基地，啊，通过这种产业园区、工业基地，来把高端制造业给它加强。Over 2,500 years ago, Samarkand was built on the riches of the old Silk Road. Now, perhaps a renaissance is coming for Central Asia. Connected to China's new Silk Road by a network of roads, rails, power grids, oil pipelines, and an array of projects, this vast land of opportunity looks poised to reclaim its place at the center of global trade. <laughs>